Press live. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. We have some exciting news here at Kevin State Tour. Tomorrow, March 2nd, we're launching our crowdfunding campaign on the Indiegogo platform. Please donate and share our link at https cabinetshr.co slash crowdfunding. Our guest today is Juana Toro Torini. Juana, are you ready to be great today? Oh, yeah, every day. <laughs> Wanda, also known, as, also known as Dr. Wanda, or the Nerdy Girl Entrepreneur, <laughs> is quite a seasoned entrepreneur but even more unique, she is a natural inventor. Her latest brainchild, CatchWords.com, has fellow entrepreneurs unveiled the anonymous fans and stopped leaving money on the table. She has a unique combo of super analytical and super creative as a rock star marketing and audio audience engagement. This can be a fun ride. Wanda, thanks for being here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. So, Wanda, what is a nerdy girl entrepreneur? What is oh, that? that's a good question. Well, uh, so you see my background, I have a doctor in pharmacy and I work, I started working for the pharmaceutical industry. So I was in the corporate world. Um, but inherently I'm super nerdy because of that, like scientific, um, and, and graduate school sort of background. So I found actually that there was a, a unique way that I was approaching entrepreneurship. I mean, even, even the idea of becoming an entrepreneur became scarier and scarier as I became more and more comfortable with my corporate job, right? Because I got my doctorate. I was fortunate enough to have a really high paying job and, um, and I, I still had this calling, like I felt like I needed there was more for me to give um, that wasn't within that space, right? But what happens is it's a it's kind of shackles because it, it you have more to lose when you decide to become an entrepreneur. And so as I dove off in, into being an entrepreneur, um, I recognized that I was keeping I was keeping the traits of being a doctorate, an analytical person and being in corporate. And those things actually didn't necessarily work out for me as an entrepreneur. And so over time, I realized, wow, this is a really unique way that you approach business. And so I kind of deemed myself the nerdy girl entrepreneur. And I found that a lot of people were like, nerd. Yes, yes. I want to con connect with you. You're a nerd because we just look at things very differently. And what happens is it's important to recognize that sometimes your nerdiness can actually be a detriment because you overanalyze stuff and you also wind up, um, you wind up doing too many things yourself because you're like capable of doing it. Um, and, uh, and that's not how you grow a business. The way you grow a business is by really figuring out what your unique brilliance is and hiring other experts to um, to do the rest. It took me a long time to, <laughs> to figure that out. So Rhonda, so most people are creative, but not analytical. Most people are not analytical, not creative and vice versa, right? Uh -huh. Are you doing both? How do you, and, and both, both of them you know, you know, think differently, right? Creatives usually don't think analytically and vice versa. How do you balance both of them since you're, you're, you're good at both of them? Yeah, yeah. So what's interesting is I realize I, I kind of have to get myself into one zone or the other, right? Um, and I almost have to like tell myself, okay, you have permission. You're going to be like super analytical, get into the numbers and get into like the fun of problem solving and stuff. But, but what's interesting is problem solving is actually analytical and creative, right? Because on the creative side, you get the opportunity to be visionary and to think of things that don't exist, right? And then I could throw that creative idea into the analytical side and then hash it out and, um, and figure out, um, I almost kind of like, I like to poke holes into things. It's almost like a hacker, a hacker mentality. I, I actually was on a, po a podcast with like an expert security hacker. And he said, wow, you really have a hacking brain. I'm like, oh, I didn't realize. But as he described it, it's like, I'm purposely trying to find holes in the, in the situation so that I can solve them before they're found by somebody else, right? Which is kind of a hacker mentality. But in order to um, successfully do either, I find that I have to kind of tell myself, okay, you're in this zone or the other zone. Otherwise I don't do either of them well. And I wind up 
kind of being frustrated because I know I could do better. And I'm like, why is that? It's because both both sides of my brain are kind of conflicting. So like I, I perform in musical theater and when I was in the corporate world and being super analytical in that way, my balance was to be able to perform in musical theater and there like, I, you know, I take, I take direction from somebody else and I just completely get into this like really creative mindset in becoming somebody else. Right. Um, and so that was like a way of me cutting out time. It's like, okay, here I'm creative and here I'm analytical, but now as an entrepreneur, my creativity is, is more valuable within my workspace. And I had to really learn how to, how to balance that. So I could get the most out of both. Wanda. Like when you do analytics, how do you keep yourself from going down rabbit holes? I think a lot of analytical people go down these rabbit holes and oh. before you know it, they're way, way from where it's supposed to be. How do you keep yourself from doing that? Oh, yeah. Um, it's hard. You have to set boundaries for yourself. Um, and um, yeah, you have to set boundaries. Sometimes it's literally a time limit. It's like, okay, you're going to spend this amount of time to assess X, Y, Z. Um or it's really kind of a, a balance of risk versus benefit. It's like, okay, well, you could analyze the hell out of the part of my language out of something, but like at a certain point, like it's not going to benefit the situation anymore, right? Um, but then I, I honestly, I just learned from other entrepreneurs because what happens is in, in a corporate environment, you have an external uh, force, usually management, right? That's telling you like, okay, you can analyze this, but I need this done by X amount of date or uh, X date and time or whatever, right? Or you have that, that pressure. But what happens is when you're analytical, but you don't have that uh, accountability or pressure from an external party, you could, like you said, you could just keep going, keep going, keep going. So in turn, you kind of have to manage yourself and say, all right, I have until, you know, March 31st to, to decide on this particular thing and, and then put forth the effort to do that. So the, the short answer is boundaries you have to establish boundaries for, for yourself. And that's how you stop, you know, going into the rabbit hole. What also happens is that as an entrepreneur, you have an emotional um, connection to the result. So it kind of forces you to overanalyze because, you know, when your boss and when you were working for somebody else and your boss is like, okay, you have to, you know, make this decision in, in, you know, two weeks, um, you're like, all right, this is the best I, I could do in two weeks. And, and, and we live with the consequences, but when it's yourself, you're like, oh, I don't know. Do I want to live with the consequences? Maybe I should give myself an extra week. You know what I mean? Um, so boundaries is the answer and it's very tough. There's a lot of discipline associated with, with giving yourself the boundaries. So how does and your become, clients and your clients' boundaries, by the way, that's really important too. How does one become a good analytics? Do you need a master's or something? Is this a matter of doing it over and over again to build up the muscle memory? How does one become like a great analytics person? No. So what I realized is um it's there's a there's a logic component that of like just how I always thought, but I didn't I, I didn't understand what that meant. You know, and so I think that if you're very analytical inherently, if people are inherently analytical, then your environment can really amplify that, right? Like if you're, uh, let's say my, my, my dad was an auditor, right? So he inherently was always looking at details and such. So then as a kid, I knew that my, my dad would look at details. And if we did something like, I'd want to be like, super analytical about making sure that all the all the details were kind of taken care of but if my dad wasn't like that then i probably wouldn't have like built up that muscle right um and that was just inherently uh, clearly he's analytical in nature right and he he just kind of got attracted to a job that was an analytical as well but then came my creative side and that's where like <laughs> the conflict is but i believe that people are have an inherent um, if, if you're either inherently analytical, uh, you know, from a strength perspective or probably inherent, inherently creative, and then your environment can help to improve one, one or the other. And I was fortunate, my mom, super duper creative. So, um, so I was able to kind of build both muscles with, with both of them, but then that wound up being a little bit of a quandary until I realized how to really utilize it for myself and for others.
So I wonder, you got a doctorate in pharmacy and became yeah. an entrepreneur. To me, that seems like a huge leap, right? Is this a leap as big as I think it is? And how did you Dude. go about doing this? What's the process? Yeah. It's a crazy leap because I'll tell you why it's a bigger leap in the sense that, um, you know, if I go back to my family life, my dad worked his butt off. He worked his butt off um, and um, and he really worked hard to give us a better life, but we really, really struggled financially. And one of my goals was to never hear, never have my children here fighting about money because it broke my heart, like knowing how much my dad was working so hard to he still hear, um, still hear discussions and like uh, just this negative ugh, about money, like it always being like a struggle, right? Um, and believe me, like he, he's like, he's a superstar, but, um, but it was still a, a thing. And so my, in my world, nobody, I didn't know anybody, uh, know anybody that was an entrepreneur really um, close. I didn't have anybody to learn about that. So to me, the, the path out was to go to school and to go to more school and go to more school. Right. So I, so I go and I get my doctorate degree. And although um, the analytical kind of worked out there, um, I felt like there was a creative side of me that I thought was like business that I wanted to, to work out. So now I find myself thankfully given being given the opportunity to learn marketing for a pharmaceutical company. So that allowed me to start integrating creativity into, into my world. So now I'm a marketing and sales executive in the pharmaceutical world. I get to merge my medical background with, with some marketing and creative stuff. And I still have the desire to do more and do something different, but I'm making, I'm going to share this, not like the, just to help understand the leap. I was making 165 K 15 years ago, right. At a pharmaceutical company and my accountant, and I told my accountant, okay, I think I'm going to start my own business. He said, are you freaking kidding me? Like, what are you a nut? And I was like, I don't know. I'm just, I don't feel fulfilled. <laughs> Right? It's like, what are you crazy? And why it was a bigger leap was because I was finally financially comfortable, like to the point where I was able to like send my parents to Spain on vacation and not have to have these arguments or issues. Like I could lend money to friends. Like, and I felt at such peace because that was so hard for me. And then I choose something that friggin' threw me into like financial strife, like continuous, like, <laughs> and, um, and that's why it's even more, not only the doctorate, but the fact that um, I worked so hard to have that comfort level, but that financial comfort wasn't giving me, giving my soul comfort. And I wound up trading that for a long time, um, you know, to, to try and find, you know, what, what was my purpose. So were you married at this time when you made the switch? No, I wasn't. Thank goodness. <laughs> because I'm sure some, I'm sure whoever that would, would have been at that time would have been like, what are you crazy? Um, yeah. So my poor husband now, not my poor husband, he's amazing. Um, I found him later in, in my life, but I was already an entrepreneur for eight years. And, um, and because it's such a, it's such a difficult journey, right? Like we could be like super successful. And then it's like, I'm going to try and launch a new product. And it's like, there goes our, our revenue. And, and um, thank goodness he loves me and he has faith, you know, in, in me and, and, and what I'm trying to, to do in, in this world. But it's, it's like freaking buckle up. We're going on for a ride. And I, I cry a lot when I feel like, oh shit, like I'm going I'm going after like my heart, my, my purpose, like my, what I feel is my calling. And then like, I'm dragging, and now I have two kids, I'm dragging my whole family on for that ride. And it does modify how I kind of do things now. Cause I was a lot more renegade when it was just me, you know? Um, but it's, 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 even when you're successful, um, it's, it's just a completely different, um, it's a completely different world than when you're successful in corporate. Like you could bank on that, that great paycheck and there's, there's a high probability you're going to keep going up, right? Very low probability that you're going to go from like six figures and then like 
crash, right? You just go and get an, another job in the same industry. But when you're an entrepreneur and you're feeling out like different, different products and stuff like that, um, when you decide to pivot, that literally could be like, woohoo, I'm making seven figures. Woohoo, I'm making four. <laughs> you know? So it's, it, it's quite a ride. Yeah. So my husband, my husband still agreed to marry me <laughs> after watching and saying, wow, this is, this is crazy. I'm like, are you sure? You sure you want to marry into crazy? Cause it's not just me. <laughs> it's your life. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people when they become entrepreneurs they don't, they don't realize the support they need from the people around them. Right. Cause it has to be more than, you know, your spouse or who you think of others saying, yeah, do what you want. I support you. It has to be like all in, right. You, I mean, all the way. Yeah, actually, it's it's pretty critical. And I, I feel for um, entrepreneurs who don't have support from at least their immediate partner. Um, and there are so many of us out there that that don't have that. And, and the support is not because they don't love you. It's actually in most cases, it's because they love you <laughs> and they, they they're afraid and they don't know. Right. So they want to protect you. And so they kind of keep you they want, they want to keep you in the safe zone. And we all know that growth is outside of our comfort zone, outside of that safe, safe zone. Right. So, um, it's, my husband is very like even keel, uh, from, uh, uh, energy perspective. And I'm like the high energy, like, ah! you know, and, um, and it's, it, it's a great balance. Um, but there, there have been some leaps and decisions, like actually like like first invent investing in coaching. That was very difficult for my husband to support. And you know, like we could spend a lot of money in, in coaching and support. And because he loved me and so many of us, I'm sure have heard like, why do you need that? You could do this. Like, you don't need a coach. Like you're smart. You could do this. Like you totally got this. Why do you have to like dump money into somebody else or whatever? It's because we don't have that management. We don't have that external management that kind of keeps us. So, so our emotional selves just keep on putting ourselves down. Like, no, you really can't do that. Or no, don't mess up. You're going to fail. You're, you know? And um, so that was a difficult decision for him to support, for me to spend so much money starting to, to get expert coaches. And then he realized like, holy crap, I, I didn't realize that you seemed smart, you seemed strong to me. So I didn't realize that having that additional support and community would make you even stronger. Yeah, and, I, I, and yeah, I, I, think, I think a good example, like like your spouse loving you, but trying to keep you safe. Like like suppose your husband, like once a month, sent you some um, um, open job descriptions for people with doctor of pharmacies, right? You're like, yeah. okay, what's the, what's going on here, right? I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Like, why are you sending these to me, right? <laughs> you say you support me, but you know, like, what's going on? Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's hard. Um, it's it's very important for us to do um, work on ourselves to understand what's driving us as well so that we can better communicate to the people that love us right when 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 people see it as like you're just making a purely emotional like crazy decision right then um then it's harder for them to understand now my husband is also analytical he has an engineering background right so for him it there there's like definitely a, a, a logic kind of argument to, to everything. But then he also could see like the dynamic, how he understood my, he understood my journey of leaving a high paying job because I wasn't happy. He understood that. Right. And um, a lot of people don't, they feel like, well, work like you're not supposed to be happy at work like that's right like that that's what we learned it's like oh yeah like mom and dad they went to work and it was like nobody knows this trouble I've seen you know what I mean and 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 that's just what they feel it should be so it's kind of like stop your whining and you seem like you're a freaking daydreamer to actually think that you could do something that you enjoy but my husband understood um because I had been showing him like, look, I, en I enjoy this and guess what? And I, and I left my, my job. So that, that was, 
that's a big thing. But the point is we need to be able to communicate to our loved ones what it means to us and how um, I think for many of us as entrepreneurs, like literally our souls would be like broken. Like, you know what I mean? We would be so much more unhappy people if we were doing like the J-O-B and, um, and being able to communicate that and, and the impact on them, right? Like I'm a better wife, I'm a better mom, I'm a better friend because I'm kind of in my happy zone or the, or once I get closer and closer, then I'm even, (laughs) that I'm even better at all of those things. Wanda, what is a catch word and why do you spell it (laughs) K-E-T-C-H? Oh, that's a, oh man, you are getting into some good things. Okay. So let me tell you what catch words is, uh, first of all. So what catch words are, are these, um, let me rewind as to really what my mission is first and how Catchwords does it. So my mission is to help experts, entrepreneurs who love to share their expertise, right? They're typically very service-minded, impact-driven people, and they love to share their expertise through speaking engagements, through media interviews and such, right? And they want to be able to extend that impact and make sure that every single one of those engagements actually gives them leads for their business, right? It's not just about like feeling good and just yapping, 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 but it's, it's for business purpose. So we help them connect to those anonymous fans, because every single time we're out there speaking, doing our do, right? There are people that are listening or watching that are like, ooh, I wanna learn more about that. And then there's this freaking pesky psychological law, because remember, I'm a nerd. So there's a psychological law called the law of diminishing intent, which means the longer we wait to do something, the lower the probability it is that we're gonna do it. Okay. So we've all done it, right? It's like, oh, I really want to like, look, look into X, Y, Z. The longer we wait, lower the chance is that we're going to do it. So, so what happens is we do these interviews or we speak, and then we invite people to email us or go to our Facebook page or go to our LinkedIn page and people don't do it. And so they lose leads as an opportunity there. So what we do is we create these catch words. These are textable keywords that allow people to text for content, right? So here, for example, um, if there's anybody in your audience that loves to speak, right, loves to do media interviews, they could, you, they understand the feeling of, um, I call it feeling like a one night stand, right? Where you're like, you, you do this great talk and everybody's like, oh my God, you're amazing. And then you're like, I have no second dates. Nobody, nobody connected with me afterwards, right? So, um, So I created this strategy of how to transform every one of these talks appearances into a lead gen machine, right? And I wrapped it, that strategy around this texting technology that I actually invented. So if anybody speaks in the audience, I invite them to try it out and text leads, L-E-A-D-S to 411321. So the phone number is 411321 if you're in the U.S., and the message is leads, L-E-A-D-S, right? And it'll ask for your email address if you haven't used our service before. And immediately it's going to email you um, a- an email with an attachment. And that attachment will be this PDF, right? This guide on how to transform your talk into a lead gen machine. Now I'm explaining it a little bit more because I'm the inventor um, of it. So I wanted to kind of explain the experience, but what happens is, um, by creating this, so I invented the, the texting platform that allows people to text for information. We're the only people in the globe to do that. What's unique it, when somebody texts, and you guys will, will experience it if you actually text leads to 411321, is that you're going to get a text saying, hey, yep, check your email inbox. Then you're going to get a really nice designed HTML email. That means like with graphics and stuff. And then you're going to get that email has an attachment, that little paper clip attached, right? So that's a, there's a difference in that because when people get an email with that little paperclip attached to it, then um, it's perceived to be more important. It's like, oh, I, I have something 
in there, right? And so our open rates for emails are an average of 150%, which means if somebody texts your catchword, they're probably going to open up your email 1.5 times. And for anybody out there that knows email metrics, like that's ridiculous. Like a good campaign is 12 to 25%. So you see, I'm talking numbers because I'm analytical, but the point is that um, what we do is I, I invented the texting technology, but I realized that if people don't use it correctly, then they're not gonna be able to wield the power of the technology. And the things that I learned over time was that it was important how you physically present it, right? So we actually design all this stuff. We design the backgrounds. If for those of you that are watching in video, we design the backgrounds and the, and the pop-up here for, for the catch word. We teach our clients how to actually integrate it into an interview verbally or into a presentation. We design the PDF. We design the HTML because we found that that, that professional appearance really helps to warm people up to work with you. Right. And, um, and, and like, I worked hard to make this a, a package because I know that every time, every time we speak, we're, we're missing out on those anonymous fans. And, and that could be the next client, the night, the next person that you could help. And, uh, that's, that's important. It's important to me. Cause I know, I know that that's uh, what many of us want to do is impact, you know, our, our audience. I wonder how long have you been doing this, working on this? Mm. So. I invented the texting platform 11 years ago, 11 years ago. So the texting platform is called EcoFiles. And um, I love that you're asking, uh, that you're asking the question, but it, <laughs> I get to tell the convoluted story. But 11 years ago, I mean, we've all been at, at like major conferences or whatever. So I was at this like major medical conference and um, it was in Chicago at, uh, the McCormick place for anybody who knows Chicago, but it's a huge, like a Javits center, like, like conference um, hall. And so at the end of this big conference, they were collecting all of the brochures that were being thrown out. And it was literally Jason, a, a human climbable mountain of paper. And so that day I said, my analytical self said, this is a problem. This is a lot of paper that's being thrown out. <laughs> And, um, and as a marketer, I would spend a lot of money and we like, when we pick up a brochure or when we print a brochure, we don't know who picks it up. Right. And when we pick up a brochure, that's basically the, like, there's no way for us to get updates on that brochure. Right. It's outdated immediately as soon as it's, it's, it's printed. So I called it eco files that day with the intention of creating a an easy way for people to to request eco-friendly materials. Cause I thought, man, that pile of paper, what a friggin' waste. It wasn't being recycled. It was totally being thrown out. So it took me two years to figure out, well, how can people um, request information in an eco-friendly way? This is a 2000, actually this was in 2007. So longer than 11 years ago. And um, I looked at apps, uh, QR codes, uh, near field technology, thumb drive, like all these things. And I settled on texting because you don't have to download an app. It's part of everybody's phone. Back then, if you had a clamshell phone or a smartphone, it didn't matter. You could use it US globally. And so I created EcoFiles with that purpose to help people get rid of paper brochures. So then I go and, and, around. And you, and you built this yourself or you had someone build it for yeah, you? Yeah. So I, I architected in my brain because I'm a visionary. So I creatively said, this is how I want it to work, you know, mapped it out, whatever. And then I hired a tech team to actually build it out for me. So I don't, I don't actually code. Then I start selling it, trying to sell it to corporations. And they tell me, wow, that's really cool. But only teenagers text. <laughs> so I was like, no, nah! I put all this time, but you know, back then that was by yeah. that point, it was 2009 and I was too early. I was too early. And I was trying to convince them that at least like your early adopter adults, people that had smartphones, they were texting and stuff like that. But, but big companies weren't ready to make that, that shift. And so I had to table the technology fast forward to 2011 
in 2011, I was running a consulting firm and I started speaking in front of live audiences. And I literally was like, oh my gosh, I had, to, I, I have to speak in front of these audiences. And it was the pharmaceutical world. Jason, I had to pay $10,000 to speak in front of these audiences, <laughs> 10,000 bucks. And so I'm like, I need a way to make sure that I collect all the leads that I possibly can. And I thought about Ecofiles. And I'm like, well, shit, it's just sitting there. It was like a very expensive experiment. <laughs> and I'm like, why don't I just use one of these keywords to, to let my audience text for my slides? That, and that's how it came about. And then I realized, holy crap, like the first time I used it, 25% of my audience texted for my slides. I was like, this is amazing. This is more leads than I had in the past, like three, four years. And, um, and then over time I refined it with like the graphics and the verbal and the blah, 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 blah. And then I was able to get, um, 76% of my audience. Every time I spoke in front of a live audience, 76% of my audience on average would text. And I said, shit, I, it's part of my language, but it helped me grow my consulting firm to $4.2 million. But the bigger thing was it was transformational for my life, like being able to earn that much money in for my company got me back to a six figure salary. It got me a bigger team. And the weird thing is it gave me enough financial freedom to realize I didn't want to do the consulting work anymore. I wanted to do this for more people. Like I wanted to help other entrepreneurs um, connect with the people that they should be connecting to. And so that's how catch came about. Um, then you asked about why is it called catch? <laughs> I, um, I don't tell a lot of people this, but have you ever heard of shamanic journeying? No, I haven't. At least I don't right. remember it. Uh, no, most people haven't. It's a, it's a type of meditation that like, uh, that indigenous shamans would do like in the in indigenous communities. And I, I met this woman that actually taught this type of meditation to be able to like really ground and get into like your subconscious and tap into some like major creativity. So I was struggling because Ecofiles doesn't make sense, right? If you're speaking in front of audience, like Ecofiles isn't a brand that makes sense for speaking. And I couldn't figure out what to call it um, for speakers. And I went into this meditative state through shamanic journeying. And literally the, the, the process is it, it kind of, it's almost like a charades. It's almost like a dream. Like when you have like a crazy dream and you're like, I want to interpret it. That's how it is. Um, but literally my, in my meditative state, it was so annoyed with me because I couldn't figure out what it was trying to tell me. I finally, at the end of the meditation, it literally said K E T C H. And I popped out of my meditation. I was like, oh my God, catch. Because it's a, it's a play on catching. Mm -hmm. You're catching your audience. And I was like, catch, catch words. You're catching your audience. Like all these things, it just like all came together. And I ran to my husband because we were brainstorming for literally four days. We couldn't figure out what it would be. Um, our closest was like connect something. I don't know what it was. And I said, it's catch, K-E-T-C-H, catch words. And he was like, holy crap, what happened? I was like, I went on a journey and journey told me. And he was like, and he's an engineer. And he's kind of like, eh, about this journeying thing. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure he was. Yeah, he's like, mm. and he was like, wow. All righty. He was like, well, whatever it was, I think it's spot on. And that's. Jason, you got the inside scoop of how catchwords became catchwords. <laughs> now everybody's going to think I'm kooky, but hey, I told you I'm I'm, I'm a unique a unique brand of a blend of creative and analytical. <laughs> that, that's a great story. So for the testing platform, how do you make sure the tech side is like up to date? Are you working? You have a team that does that for you? How does that work to make sure? Oh yeah, things up to date? yeah. Yeah, we have a development team and I have a CTO, a chief technology officer that helps to actually make sure that we're like up to snuff on all the stuff. Cause um, with texting, it's really important uh, because a lot of people abuse email and spam and such, but texting falls under like the te telephony, like the telephone guidelines and FTC guidelines and stuff like that. Because 
understandably, right? If somebody texts you and spams you, it's like a huge invasion, right? There's, it's, it's hard to, uh, to block people. You don't have folders to put spam into whatever. So they're very, very strict with that. And so we need to really be on it to make sure that we're doing the best for the platform and for our clients to make sure that, that everything gets delivered appropriately. So to get a little nerdy, as you say, what, what's the text platform built on? Like is, what coding language did y'all use? How's that done? Ooh, all right. So I'm not sure I can answer all the questions. I know that we recently um, did a full rebuild on, um, on AWS. So on uh, Amazon Web Services, we, um, we found that the Lex, um, the, Le the Lex um, minder or engine, the Lex engine um, that Alexa uses, for example, it was really powerful. And so we actually integrated that into, um, into our platform because it allows us in the future, if we want a catch word to actually be requested in other ways outside of just texting, um, then we could use the, the brain of the Lex engine to kind of help us with that. So that's kind of a little behind the scenes sort of stuff. So, you know, you, you kind of build the application using uh, a certain platform, then of course there's custom build around it. Um, but just just recently, the past couple of years, we actually decided that AWS and the Lex engine was super duper powerful. And so we could expend our, our energy on customizing how we actually use the Lex engine. Wanda, how do you inspire people to never say never? Ah, <laughs> um, I hopefully as part of part of my story in general, because I felt um, first, when I got a doctor in pharmacy, I was like, crap, I'm stuck in this. I'm never going to be able to be an entrepreneur. I'm never going to be able to. And then all of a sudden, like, just, just putting it out there, actually, the re the way I got into the corporate world is that as I was actually applying for these medical positions, they're, they're called residencies. Um, I, uh, one of my deans said, Wanda, like, I hear that you're doing really well in your interviews. Um, you're, you're going to be able to go anywhere that you want to go. Um, how do you feel about that? And I was like, I verbalized, I was like, I'm a little conflicted because I feel like there's something else that I should be doing. And he's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, see, I perform in musical theater and then I do this thing and I wish that there was something to blend the two. And he said, have you thought about marketing in the pharmaceutical industry? And I'm like, never knew it was an option for me. And he's like, actually, no, at that time, Novartis Pharmaceuticals is, is have, do, has this very unique opportunity and it was a marketing position. They're like, oh, they wanted to see how it was, would be to bring a healthcare professional into marketing and teach them, right? If I didn't put that out there, he wouldn't have never told, he would have never told me about that opportunity, right? So it was like, ooh, never say never there. I, gosh, I have so many stories, but my biggest story is that I found my husband late. I told you when I, I was 40 years old, I, I found my husband. And by that point, I was like, babe, are you sure you want to marry me? First of all, I'm a crazy entrepreneur and I'm 40 years old and I don't know if I'm going to be able to have kids. And um, he said, I love you no matter what, you know, we'll, whatever. And, um, and we tried to have children and I was told I wasn't able to have children. And, um, and that was very, very difficult. I felt like I let him down. He's five years younger than me. So, so I was like, oh my gosh, look at what you bought into. And um, we really persevered. We went through like so many different, I went through like mindset work and yoga and blah, 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 and all these things. But I persevered. I kept on trying. And then catch was a real, well, what was Ecofiles was a big transformation for me because when I made that $4.2 million in revenue, I was also able to invest over a hundred thousand dollars in my fertility journey. And that was like 10 rounds of IVF and all of this stuff. And, and I was finally able to have my babies. Right. So I had my first, my daughter when I was 44 turning into 45 and I'm 49 now, and I have an, a nine month old and, um, 
And it was amazing how like how I got there wasn't anywhere how I expected. Like the path was so messed up, but I kind of kept my eye on the carrot. And my dad always told me since I was little, he's like, Wanda, if you want something, keep your eye on the carrot. I'm like, what does that mean? He's like, you know, like when you have the donkeys and they just keep the carrot dangling and you just keep going, just keep your eye on the carrot. And, and it helps, it helps to take away everything else and keep your eye on that goal. And I kept my eye on the carrot of having a family somehow. And I finally was able, was gifted by the universe uh, to do that. So by sharing my stories, I just hope that it it allows people to say, hey, your path may not be exactly how, like look at Ecofiles. I built Ecofiles and it, it, it got rejected for what it was originally going to be. But I actually feel like, like this path is, is a beautiful path and I get to help others by creating catch words for their, for their business too. Um, so I never said never, right? <laughs> and just keep on, keep your eye on the carrot. And Wanda, it'll come to you some way. How has being a parent to young kids changed your outlook on entrepreneurship, if any? Um, more boundaries, right? And um, and really prioritization, right? So I think, unfortunately, as entrepreneurs, once we really get into the entrepreneurial world, um, like in the beginning, especially, we're kind of taught to hustle, 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 hustle. But what happens is um, we we really tend to uh, not take care of ourselves as a result of that. We don't take care of our relationships very well, right? Because we're hustling, hustling, hustling. And um, because I worked so hard to have these young children, um, it made me realize that at a certain point, um, the hustle wasn't worth not not being with them. I freaking worked a long ass time. I went through a 10 year freaking journey, you know, to, to have these children. And so how it changed my approach is to really make sure that I'm super efficient and effective with my time. And when I shut off, I need to shut off. And that's really hard. But, um, I actually feel like at first I felt super stressed about it. Like, um, in a guilty sense, I felt like, oh, my kids are taking away <laughs> from my business. And I'm like, um, you're doing this so that you could be with your family more. And then I had to switch it and say, wait, my business is taking away. No, no, no. I just have to do things more effectively. And this is why I also tell people that um, connecting to experts is rocket fuel, right? Like just figure out where you have to be, what's your unique zone of genius and then hire other people to help do the do the stuff and it's going to accelerate your growth significantly it's a way more efficient use of of your time and a lot of people get afraid of spending the money but there's an opportunity cost to not spending the money because you're freaking wasting your money and you're uniquely brilliant at xyz not at search engine optimization or building websites or funnels or whatever right um so so that's been a big shift. Like ever since my, my daughter came on board um, or even actually ever since we got deep into like probably five years into the fertility journey where I'm like, the stress of my business is killing my opportunity to have a kid. It's not freaking worth it. I need to really optimize my time and be able to shut off and it's an, it's, it's an amazing um, lesson that I wish I learned earlier. I probably could have accomplished a lot more earlier if I did that too. So Wanda, how do you make sure you focus when you need to focus on like you, your due priorities are right? Do you like, you have certain tools you use or you just analytical like that and you just everything flows for you? Like, how do you figure all that out with everything you have going on? Uh, so I, I feel like block scheduling has been, like really super valuable for me. So block scheduling, meaning like I look at my calendar on a weekly basis and I'm like, okay, I'm going to block, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday from nine to noon is client time. Right. And then like, like literally put block. Now it, it's not perfect all the time. 
Sometimes you have to book a client time during sales calls time, or you have to, you know, but, um, but if you actually try and keep committed to blocking things, especially, especially we talked about earlier, creative things and analytical things, right? So it's like, I found that if I do finance stuff earlier in the day, it's better because at the, by the end of the day, I feel like it's like an energy suck. Um, and then I don't, I never do it. So I have to do it early, um, so that I could get it over with. So really understanding your strengths, the the energy sucks, all that stuff. And then block scheduling, um, has really helped me, but I hire an expert for that. I have an accountability and productivity coach who specializes in ensuring that I stay accountable to my goals every month. Like I have monthly schedule, a monthly planning with her. She checks on me every day because I'm an entrepreneur. Nobody, nobody's my boss. I'm the boss. So if I say I, my goal is to have 20 sales calls this month and nobody checks in on me, I can make tons of excuses to be like, oh, well, this is why I didn't do 20 this month this month, but I hire somebody to keep me accountable to myself and, and to check in, like, are you sure you're not just like psyching yourself out and saying you can't do 20 because of X, Y, Z. And, um, so I know that that's like a weakness zone. And so I hire somebody to do that. And then my other thing is mindset. Sometimes we could really get like down in the dumps about whether we're doing the right thing. And so I hire a mindset coach and that person totally focuses on, on ensuring that I'm, I'm doing the right things to manage my energy, to stay positive, et cetera. And, and that's why I say like investing in those experts have been like rocket fuel for me. So here's a question for you. Like suppose there's an entrepreneur, entrepreneur out there, right? And people say you need to get a coach, you get a coach. This entrepreneur saying, well, you know what? I'm working 60, 70, 80 hours a week already. I'm doing all this. I mean, First of all, I don't have, time. I, I don't have the, yeah, I don't have the, first of all, I don't have the money because they're going to charge me a lot of money, which I need to put in the business. And I, how am I going to find the time to have some quote unquote strength to tell me what to do? And, oh, I probably already know I need to do it. So how, yeah. do you, how do you work through that? Well, it's exactly that. You already know you need to do the stuff, but for some reason you haven't done it for some reason. And you have to acknowledge that there's some reason why you're not doing the shit that you know that you need to do, right? And so that external force is really valuable. But the biggest thing is we're working 60 to 70 hours a week because we don't have somebody that is helping to guide us in optimizing the time, right? When you think of like kick-ass Olympians, like, and, you know, athletes, they have coaches, Right there, uh, the, of course, they're, they're naturally their bodies are really good. They know that they have to wake up and do this and blah, blah, blah. but guess what? Their coach is going to tell us, they know that they have to exercise and eat right, but their coach is going to say, okay, for you, this is what you need to do to optimize, right? Otherwise they could be running every day. And maybe for that particular body, they need to be running in intervals and, and doing this, these types of weights or whatever, but an expert will be able to tell them that, right? So I would argue and from experience that the reason we're working ridiculous hours is because we're not tapping into the guidance of other people that have done it already. And there's no, re- like all of us feel like, oh my gosh, but we're, we're going through our own like journey, but guess what? There's a friggin' roadmap. There's a blueprint for how in general to manage yourself as a business and the experts know how to do it. So why it, it's just ego. Like for me, it was like ego figuring out, oh, I'm a nerdy girl, right? I, I have a doctorate. I should be able to figure this out. And, and it took me way too long. It took me 10 years to tap into a coach, 10 years. And the growth that I have had from year 10 to 15 has been like exponential in comparison to, to you know, what I had before that, right? So I would argue that one, you're spending too much time because you don't have guidance. You don't have expert guidance. And two, um, that there's an opportunity cost. It seems like you're spending money, but you're actually losing the opportunity to make money because you're not working effectively and doing the right things. I hope that makes sense. It does. And for athletes, the example I use all the time is 
I can't remember the number wrong, but I think LeBron James invests like one or two million dollars in his in himself every year, like for coaching and you know nutrition on whole nine yards, right? And it's important for everyone. It's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. And he, and he he's and he's brilliant. It's like oh, he's you're not just like born. You know, you're born with like the seed. Right. And then it has to be, it has to be nurtured. And, and guess what? There are expert gardeners that know, like you need these nutrients, you need these things to, to get that amazing, amazing, like plant tree or whatever it is. Right. So um, that's the thing. So get out of your own way, sign up, like sign up with an expert that resonates with you. Right. That's the, that's the important part. You know, like for, for me, I, I tell people, hey, okay, you might play around with, you might be able to say, well, I know marketing. Like I have clients that are marketing experts, but they can't freaking do it for themselves, right? It's, it's difficult to do, like your unique brilliance, it's difficult to apply it to yourself, right? So I'm that framework for, for them. And I'm, I'm super, I'm a checklist accountability like queen, like I love or my I love systems. I tell my 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 team I like trackers, all this stuff, right? But for myself, I just can't. I I love doing it, but then the moment like a mindset issue comes into play, the moment I start doubting myself, my energy is down. Like there's so many factors that could get me off of that path. That um that's where that's where I have you know my coaches to make sure that. I don't allow myself to go down those rabbit holes. So I want to change the subject a little bit. Mm -hmm. How long have you been a singer in a rock and soul band? <laughs> um, I've been singing like for forever. Um, the, the one band I'm, I'm in, uh, American Rapture, we, we just, well, obviously pre COVID, um, we would play out just a couple of times a year, um, together, but that's going on 20 years. I've been in that band. Um, but, along along the way i've had a lot of different bands i had a punk band you know that was really really fun and having my parents go, go to that concert they're like what happened? what are you what are you doing i'm like sorry there's gonna be a lot of cursing i'm gonna be like angry wanda but this is like you know this is the persona and it was great therapy too <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I, I, I love performing on, on all different levels, like musical, the difference is musical theater, you're playing a part, right? And that part, like the audience knows, has an expectation of who Maria and West Side Story should be, or who Ava Peron should be in Evita, right? Like, so you have to fit into that and you could put your own flavor to it, but you have to meet that expectation. But when you're in a band, you get to be yourself. So that's what I really, really love about it. And you get, I love, you know, singing male songs and songs that people wouldn't typically imagine me to sing. And then that's the fun part. What was the biggest crowd you sung in front of? Um, 3,000, I think. 3,000. Um, I, I had the pleasure of being able to, hmm, well, I think that, so there, there are two shows that I did that were in front of a, a lot of people. Um, I played Ava and in, in I, or Evita in Evita, and I played um, oh my good Donna, the lead in Mamma Mia, and those were really really large large audiences, and so that was really awesome. And the energy that you get from the audience, Mamma Mia was the most energetic because Evita. I don't do you know at, at those shows at all? Yeah, I, I do. Yeah, so Evita is is a gorgeous show, but it's very like intense for the audience. So it's more kind of like, I love feeling like the emotional pull, especially like towards the end of the show. But Mamma Mia is just like joy, joy, joy. Um, so in both cases, like the, the energy from the audience is amazing. And, and that's, to me, when we perform, we should be performing to create energy and impact for an audience. And so whether it's speaking in front of an audience, whether it's interviewing or it's performing in front of a state in, in, in front of an audience, like for theater and such, um, I think if we put our audience first, then we're a lot more successful. Have you ever released any records? No, no, I have not. 
No, I've recorded things like for children's theater and stuff like that, but I've never released a record that I mean, my mom keeps on saying like, please, one of her things is like, please be on Broadway as if like, I'm like, no, mom, I don't want to be on Broadway. <laughs> like, so I, I, there might be an opportunity someday, maybe, you know, maybe they'll be like, hey, we're going to invite a couple of randoms to do, to do a cabaret on a Broadway stage and I could check off that box, but never say never. Exactly. Never say never. So also says you've done some children theater and musical theater production. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. So I love doing children's theater because, uh, like I said, you know, I did Evita and, you know, other like musical theater stuff, but children's theater, they tell you exactly what's on their mind. They have yes, like they no filters. <laughs> so it's, it's awesome because it's awesome because you know, you're creating memories for them. Like there are adults that remember like, oh my goodness, when I saw Cinderella, like, it's like, you could tell like these kids are really impacted and and the children's theater that i that i had done and i say and i will continue to do post covid um it uh we would stay dressed in our costumes and then meet the kids afterwards so it's like seeing their reaction to, was really cool now since i'm older i'm always playing the the witches earlier but when i was younger i was playing like snow white and pocahontas and uh, and jasmine and aladdin and all that stuff and now i'm just like yeah you're you know ursula <laughs> you're the evil mother <laughs> but it's it's fun it's fun but the kids don't love you as much <laughs> afterwards that's too funny that's too funny um how has covid affected your business if any uh covid really kick me in the gut. So, so I told you, you know, the whole story of eco files and everything. And then when I finally decided on catch and catch words, um, my, my business had primarily been serving corporations. And so it took me a couple years to pivot away from that because we had kind of created a reputation in that space and I wanted to switch or whatever. So finally, long story shortish, um, in March of 2020 was when we were finally ready to launch catchwords for entrepreneurs. And my whole, all of my advertising, my marketing message was around speaking in front of live audiences, like in-person audiences. And so literally I remember that week and our ads, we had lots of ad engagement and, you know, over time, it takes a couple days for the ads to warm up. And then we saw, and we're like, yay. And psh, nothing. And I'm like, what happened? I called Facebook. I'm like, is there something wrong with our ads? Or like, we got nobody responding. And it was basically when they were announcing the, the lockdowns and people are like, why do I need to catch my audience? And I'm not going to be speaking in front of an audience. And um, I, that was in March, my baby was due in May and like everything fell apart because I had the whole plan with the team, like how I was gonna go into maternity leave, we would have done our launch, blah, 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 blah. And it just, everything crumbled and I didn't have enough time to, to repair and pivot before having my baby. And so I had to choose family first. I'm like, I, this is totally stressful. Like I can't be in a higher stress situation. I'm 48 years old at the time, right? <laughs> Having a baby like, eh. um, so it was, it was really, really hard. We lost tons of money. I had to let go of most, most of my team. Um, and then I, I spent a couple months, you know, with, with my son and then I had to come back. And so you could imagine like, while, while a lot of people were like doing their pivot, figuring out or whatever, I was out of the game and out of the game, losing major money that we put into this entire launch. And, um, and now we're finally coming back out of it. But you see, this is like, I know catch words and my husband knows um, and my clients, like this will be the gold standard call to action for people like moving forward when you're on a TV show, when you're on a radio show, where when you're speaking, like you should be offering people these, these catch words. Um, but it was like COVID just said, 
<laughs> not now. Um, but the difference was I would have never done this, you know, th this whole digital thing that I'm showing you now in my pivot. I realized it's not only people speaking in front of live audiences, like in-person audiences, it's anybody who speaks in front of an audience is losing out on connecting to anonymous fans. So it actually, and I'm sure you've heard a lot of people say like COVID was this like mixed blessing because it allowed me to pivot. And actually I get to help and reach more people as a result of the pivot and introducing catchwords, not only for physical stages, but for digital stages as well. Yeah, there's no doubt COVID is bad, but COVID has definitely been an opportunity for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been horrible. I've lost family members. I've had best friends lose parents. Like, you know, being, having lived in, in New Jersey and family in New York, like we were hit big time. Um, is, and it's still, it's still horrible. I'm, I, I celebrate that finally, like my parents and my mother-in-law all got their first vaccine. Um, and so that's huge because a, a lot of times we were like, oh my gosh, like my, my mother-in-law was saying, like, am I going to fumble before the, before the, <laughs> the finish line, you know, am I going to get sick before I get the vaccine? And it really worried us a lot. Um, so, but yeah, but in, in the Northeast, it was just really, really hard and it's, it's still, it's still with us. So that part most definitely has been heartbreak and scarring. Um, but from a business perspective, I would say there's definitely a lot of scars, <laughs> financial scars, um, as well, but a lot of learning opportunity and the perseverance, right? Never say never. That's really important because a lot of people just gave up. And, um, but there are a lot of people that s said never say never and have come out the other end even better. Yeah. And in my opinion too, and just my opinion, I think the COVID, everything went on with it exposed a lot of entrepreneurs who probably should have been entrepreneurs, right? Yeah. I, I, I hate, I hate to say, say it. Yeah. I mean, entrepreneurship is not an easy thing, right? So there's, you have to start with the spark of the dream and the passion, but I think the big difference is recognizing all these things that I'm, that I'm talking about, like recognizing um, it's kind of silly to think that you, you could do it yourself or that you should do it yourself, right? You could and not be as good as if, if you, you had coaching and experts, right? So it's also kind of your, your, um, what your, mentality is around it. Like I love to execute with excellence. I just, to me, I'm like, if I'm going to do something, I want to kick ass at it. Right. So I went to school for pharmacy and then I was like, I want to get my doctorate in pharmacy because back then it wasn't a default. Like now all pharmacists have a doctorate, but back then I actually got a bachelor's degree and then I got my doctorate degree. Um, so I always had this mentality that if I'm going to do something, I really want to kick ass at it. Um, but for some reason, in the beginning entrepreneurship, although I wanted to kick ass at, at it, I didn't have anybody to explain to me that kicking ass meant connecting with a coach, right? I just, it logically totally makes sense, but I just didn't have that exposure, you know, cause in the corporate world, only select people get coaches, right? Uh, not everybody gets the benefit of, of having a coach in the corporate world. And so um, I guess that's kind of the same thing, right? Do you want to be the mediocre? Or do you want to actually fulfill your potential? And to me, fulfilling your potential is having other people that are going to push you to be better, be surrounded by people that are way further ahead than you. So that you could be like, you could see what's possible. Um, that's really, really important because sometimes we don't know, unless you're a visionary, <laughs> like I'm a super crazy dreamer. So I dream a lot of things that hopefully someday will be possible. <laughs> Wanda, is there something I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? You asked me a lot, Jason. You got in deep. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I just, I would just say that for, I mean, obviously we talked a lot about story and stuff like that, but my current mission um, is really to help those people that are interested in and have been sharing their message through speaking and through media interviews and to really tell them like, I, I took the leap to a hundred percent. I moved away from corporate to, 
to create catchwords for entrepreneurs because of how it transformed and impacted my life. And I want to be able to deliver that. So for anybody, I'll just throw in my, my spiel again, but for anybody who wants to just get an idea as to what are some of the strategies that you could use to, to start transforming every one of your appearances into a lead gen machine, try the technology text leads L E A D S to four, one, one, three, two, one, by the way, do you have global, a global audience? Um, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, well, then we'll see if you're global, yeah. if you're outside of the US, you can actually text leads to plus one nine oh nine seven four one one three two one. So the number is plus one nine oh nine seven four one one three two one. And then the message is leads L E A D S. The system will ask for your email address. It's going to email you the guide. You're going to be able to see what the technology is like and what your audience can experience as a result of texting a catch word. And I hope that you help me uh, make this a gold standard because I really believe it can help a lot of people. Yeah, on the podcast that just says there are different countries, but podcast that podcast that we talk about, you never know what you get with them, right? Yeah, right no, I mean you're online, um, and that's that's why we like well, that was one of the things I I changed in the past like year and a half. I was like, okay, we need to make a number available for global because if we're gonna go digital, then uh, actually not not the past year and a half, last year, last year when we were scraping pennies, I said, you know what? If I'm going to try, if I'm going to also tell people you could do this on digital stages, I need to be able to have a global audiences text. And so that's where, where we added the, what we call a long code. Um, but, and you have to put plus before it, plus one, nine, oh, nine, seven, four, one, one, three, two, one. That's important. Cause then it reg registers it as a, as a country code. So Wanda, was this your, your gift for listeners or you had something else in mind for a gift? Yeah, yeah. No, this is the gift. And and okay. and when you um when you get this guide, if you want to talk to me, um, you you have the ability to actually get right on my calendar, which is not an easy, it's not an easy thing to do, but I did put a calendar link and I made uh, special slots available for my podcast listeners. Um, so if you have questions and such, then I would love to be able to, to offer you that opportunity to just chat and figure out how we can extend the impact of every one of your appearances. And Juana, can you share your social media links for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, if you're on Facebook, you can find me as Wanda Toro Torini. It's three names. Toro is my, my middle name. I'm not hyphenated. So T-O-R-O. -O. Honestly, if you look up Wanda Toro, you're going to find me. But Wanda Toro Torini. Um, you could also look up on Facebook catchwords. Um, and if I may, I'm going to add a new uh, a new group that I just uh, launched the past couple two months. It's called Rocket Fuel. And it's specifically for experts who really want to be catapulted into their next level by increasing their visibility and connecting with experts. And that's kind of like my mantra within Rocket Fuel, but it's called R it's spelled R O C K dash I T as in rock and roll. Cause you know, I love my bands. So R O C K dash I T fuel. And if you look that up on Facebook, you can find me and join the group because you're going to be connected to some amazing people. And Jason, I hope I see you in there too. So did I hear you right? Toro is actually your middle name? Yeah. So Toro was my middle name. It was my maiden name. Okay. Toro. I'm Puerto Rican, and, but I never had a middle name. Okay. And I used to, my brother and I, neither of us had a middle name. And we used to be like, Ma, Dad, why did you give us a middle name? We always felt like empty. And so when I got married, I'm like, wait a second, I'm going to create my, my last name is now going to be my middle name. So people get all confused. So my middle name is Toro. <laughs> and now I feel whole again. <laughs> and, and for our listeners, we're going to have the link to her gift and her social media and the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.kevinsakesallblog.com. And be sure to support our crowdfunding, come, crowdfunding uh, campaign by going to HTTPS, CavendishHR.co slash crowdfunding. Awesome. Wanda, what kind of end of our time together? Can you give us any wisdom or advice or anything you want to talk about? Yeah, no, I would just say, guys, if you feel like you're on the precipice of, of your next level, right, in general, um, or you feel like, gosh, okay, I know, I feel kind of stuck and I know that there's something more, then, you know, this isn't, 
I'm not a coach technically. Rocket Fuel is my way of kind of connecting people to experts and kind of satisfying that 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 objective. But really connect with expert and community. The first thing is there's tons of community on Facebook with other entre entrepreneurs. That's free. Just don't stay alone. It's feel entrepreneurship can stay feel very very lonely. And um, there's no need for it to be lonely. And it took me way too long to realize that there were other people going through that same journey. So find those people, be surrounded by those people, and then they'll be able to help kind of light, light the way as to what's the fastest path to your next level. Juana, well, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the time. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day. Oh, yeah. Okay.